Yeah, and uh, in the Law of One, Ra says, Jesus was a late fourth density wanderer. A wanderer is somebody who is at a higher density and returns back to third density to be of service and to help a struggling planet, let's say. So they said he was actually a fourth density being who was eligible to graduate to his first fifth density lifetime. And in the law of one, fifth density beings are pure light bodies, um, pure electromagnetic energy. They don't have any kind of like chemical, physical vehicle suit that they're stuck in. It's a very, very high level of consciousness. Jesus was about to graduate to that level, but instead, for whatever reason, chose to come back to third density and help this very deeply struggling civilization of the ancient Jews who were just locked in this monolithic view of God, this punitive, wrathful, vengeful, animal sacrificing view of who God is. And Jesus was like, I wanna go help that culture. And I wanna go help that culture in a really big way. He kind of understood that if I go into this culture and preach the truth, I'll be killed for it, but I'll also be remembered for it. And I can create a shift in consciousness in that culture. And uh, I think the shift he created, man, personally speaking, was even much greater than his soul anticipated it would be. Napke, welcome on the show. What are you most excited about right now in your life? I love kicking off your your podcast with this question, man. It's a it's a great loaded question, and I have a loaded answer because I'm uh, currently consumed with passion for this book that I've been writing for the better part of a year now, and I'm kind of at this culmination process where I'm about to get you know put it out to publishers and get it produced publicly which just feels so exciting, but I'm still revising the last few chapters and I'm just kind of in that flow state where I, I can't wait to get up every morning to write. And as soon as I sit down, just the perfect words and articulations come out and um, it very much feels like channeling, although it's not channeling in the traditional sense, mm -hmm. but it, it comes from a deep experiential wisdom of the journey I've traveled and just trying to distill my own spiritual journey into a book form that other people can consume that will hopefully, uh, you know, these teachings will hopefully help them the way that they've helped me. Yeah. And I heard you say once that one of your favorite spiritual catalysts is when all of your doing comes from being. So getting to that point right now, where, as you said, you're in your Aries energy, um, getting this book out to the world. Talk to us about that state of being where all of this information is coming up for you right now and pushing you to do this book and do all the videos and do all the speaking that you've been doing. Mm -hmm. Where is that state of being coming from? Well, this is an interesting topic, man, because really like we're kind of touching on masculine feminine dynamics. Um, the masculine is like the worker, the doer, the accomplisher, and the feminine is like just the beingness, the, the joy, the aliveness, the passion where everything feels effortless, right? The flow. And for me, at least, maybe it's because I'm an Aries or just my unique makeup, but I just don't really have much ability to like work from my masculine. I have to be in my passion or I feel like I'm just beating my head against a wall or something. Mm -hmm. uh, everything kind of feels futile to me if there's no passion behind it. And I feel this, um, this sense of urgency of like, I need to get clear on the why. Why am mm -hmm. I doing this right now? Is this meant for me? Is this for me if I'm not passionate about it? So for me, the doing from being just means being in my passion because I can work all day long. I can write all day long. I can teach all day long. If I'm in my joy, in my excitement, it just comes out and it's, it's like my battery is getting recharged as I use it. Mm. But just being in my hyper masculine mode of like accomplishing tasks uh, tends to drain my energy and I'm, I'm left needing to uh, put the computer away and go relax, be in nature or something like that. So that's kind of the way that I navigate the relationship is I try to really find my why and my excitement behind why I'm doing something. And you know, man, even a simple email, if you get intentional with it, you're like, oh, I gotta end this email. Okay, let's mm -hmm. get this over with. But you can kind of take that pause and say, no, 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 I wanna send this email. 
because I want to bless this person and I want to help our communication and you can find the good intentionality in it. And then all of a sudden it doesn't feel as much like work or doing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that resonates a lot with me uh, regarding the emails because a lot of people have asked me like, how do you get all these incredible guests like Aaron on the show? And it's literally when I sit down to write an email, I'll supercharge that email with love and light. And yeah, that man. and that brings us to uh, the densities that you've been exploring through the channeled work of Law of One. And even even talking about being and doing, you mentioned once that the fourth density is that density of love and understanding more towards where Jesus was coming from in his mm -hmm. teachings. The fifth density, now we're talking about the wisdom, uh, more of like that higher knowledge that like the Eastern traditions, the Buddha was coming from. Mm -hmm. And then the sixth density is the merging of those two. So where are you right now in your own journey of the wisdom and the love? And what can you tell us about those densities? Yeah, I love the densities model so much because when you, I think when you understand the way that consciousness evolves and the, the path that it takes and why, it makes so much stunning sense and has so much clarity that you can't deny it because we can already look at the three, the first three densities and really four in my opinion, and we can verifiably prove that those densities are real and exist. Mm -hmm. The first three minimum. And I can probably prove the fourth one to you as well. But the first three densities, the densities correlate to the seven chakras. Uh, the seven densities are like the chakras or chakras of the universe. And so we have them in miniature in our energy centers. Mm. So they each represent a different stage in the evolutionary journey of consciousness. So I actually like to sometimes boil it down to an even simpler dichotomy to help people understand we could really categorize the evolution of consciousness into three basic phases. And those three basic phases are all pictured in the seven energy centers. As above, so, could, so below. <laughs> right, exactly. The microcosm is the macrocosm. Hmm. So we could say that consciousness begins with, let's call it simple consciousness. And that's the consciousness of the animal, the insect. Uh, we could even say the rock, water, fire, air, just simple consciousness, consciousness itself. Uh, no no self-image, no personality inside of the consciousness yet, just awareness, beingness, yeah? Mm. Uh, animals are in that state of just pure instinct and oneness with the environment. But then eventually consciousness evolves to what we can call self-consciousness, and that is unique to the human being, where the mind essentially kind of inverts on itself and becomes an object to itself and says, oh, I exist mm -hmm. as an object in time and space. I am. And that's self-consciousness, the second phase. That's the phase human beings are currently evolving through right now. But then we get to the third and final stage of which there's a huge spectrum, but it's, let's just call it one stage. And it's cosmic consciousness. And that's when consciousness develops the awareness of Oh, I'm actually the whole universe in miniature. I am the universe knowing itself. I'm the universe expressing itself. I am in, intrinsically one with the cosmos. We call that cosmic consciousness. That is the consciousness of the Buddha, Christ, all the ancient avatars. So the seven energy centers are like the seven main stages on that journey through those three basic levels. And the first two chakras the red and the orange or the root and the sacral are simple consciousness. That's where all animals and uh, the five elements and insects all reside. <clears throat> the third chakra, the solar plexus, is where self-awareness turns on. You know, literally once that chakra becomes active, self-awareness becomes active. They're simultaneous. And once humanity evolves through the third chakra into the fourth chakra, that's the green ray heart chakra of uh, love and unity. Consciousness is now vibrating fast enough to begin perceiving the oneness and the interconnectedness and the relationship of all things. And we call that love when you perceive that. So humanity is at this critical juncture right now of trying to ascend from the solar plexus into the heart center in consciousness by getting past our belief in separation from each other and our division and our judgments 
and truly emerging into this understanding that we are all one. We are one energy, one species, one civilization, one planet. And the way we treat each other is the way we treat ourselves because we're on this planet together, a tiny little rock in space. Uh, no one else is coming to save us if we destroy ourselves. So we better get it, start getting along and start loving each other. And truly, Emilio, that is a higher level of intelligence to see that. The heart or love is more intelligent than the ego is. The ego has less intelligence than the heart. It doesn't understand or comprehend these pretty obvious basic principles of the universe, such as unity. And so that does, I'm not saying that people who live from their ego are stupid. It's just that they don't yet have the capacity in their awareness to really pick up uh, these karmic principles of oneness such that, you know, you, you feel it in your being when you wrong someone, you know, you intuitively feel I've violated a law of balance in this universe by wronging that person. So I need to make it right. I need to apologize and atone in some way. You know, that's the heart intelligence that is in direct communication with reality. It doesn't need concepts. It's directly interfacing with reality and it feels reality and it knows reality on that deeper dimension. And that's where human beings are, are slowly emerging into. And there's more and more beings on our planet every day that are emerging into that awareness, but it's still largely, you know, 90 plus percent probably dominated by ego consciousness. So we're kind of in this contrast, right, of shadow and light on our planet. Mm. And before we get into the polarities, I just wanted to mention and get into this of it's not the first time that humanity has been endowed with this knowledge and teachings of the densities and of the heart consciousness. 11,000 years ago, a being um, named Ra or a group of beings named Ra came down and visited Egypt. So what was Ra... Um, what was the purpose of, of Ra coming down so many years ago? And why are his teachings starting to come back up uh, at this time? Mm -hmm. Well, so what Ra says in the Law of One is that they, um, first of all, our planet is always being surveyed and, and monitored and you might even say protected by higher density extraterrestrial beings who are on that higher plane of heart consciousness or above. And uh, they just want to be of service to us, but they don't want to interfere with our natural evolution uh, in the same way that like when a biologist goes out into the wild to observe a herd of zebra or something, they're observing from a far distance, right? They're not running through the herd, snapping pictures and trying to, you know, kidnap a zebra or something. They're staying far back and observing. And if there really is help needed, a biologist might go in and tranquilize a zebra and like give it <laughs> medical care and then put it back with its herd. Like that's very rare, but it does happen. The abductions. <laughs> yeah. So we have these cases of abductions, right? But um, mostly they're surveying from far away. And what they do is they try to help when help is truly needed and wanted. And so what they say is that 11,000 years ago in ancient Egypt, the average lifespan was about 30 years old. And what's cool about this, bro, is that I went to a museum when I lived in Denver, which was an Egyptian Egyptology museum. And my wife and I were walking through looking at all the different, you know, fixtures and stuff. And in a number of them, they had like sarcophaguses with, you know, mummies and all that. And uh, they, the placard you would read said, um, you know, this, uh, this mummy is projected to be 6,000 to 8,000 years old or whatever. And the average lifespan during that time was about 30 years of age. Mm -hmm. So even Egyptologists affirm this, that uh, for a long, long time, maybe thousands of years, uh, Egypt, Egyptians were only living about 30 years old because of different like West Nile diseases and, and contamination in their water supply and things like that. So Ra, this um, higher density uh, civilization of of extraterrestrials was noticing, hey, these poor beings are stuck in this kind of perpetual spiritual childhood because they only live to be about 30 years old. And if you've lived to be 30 years old, you know good and well, true wisdom and knowledge doesn't even begin to percolate in you until about 30 years old. You know, <laughs> in rare cases, it happens earlier than that. And you truly learn the deeper lessons of life 
kind of beginning at that age. Mm. And so even 60 years old is an incredibly short period of time to live, to truly mm. grasp all the wisdom and the lessons that are available here, let alone 30 years, right? So they were like, we got to go help this, uh, this race to uh, extend their lifespan. And the reason that it wasn't considered infringement to do so is because Egypt was a polytheistic or pantheistic rather um, civilization where they actually believe that the sun, the moon are gods. And according to the law of one, that's actually pretty accurate. And what, the, what they call the sun and planets and stars is l the logos. Yeah. And they teach that like a star is actually a solar intelligence made by the universe. It's a, it's a mind, it's a consciousness that actually creates the zodiac of its solar system. Mm -hmm. You know, like our sun literally designed the 12 archetypes of the zodiac that all living beings will abide by. So it's a cosmic intelligence that is kind of like a god in that, in that sense. Mm -hmm. So they perceived uh, the Egyptians worshiping the sun as like, hey, they're onto it. You know, like they actually get it, they're tapped in. So it's not infringement for us to communicate with a pantheistic culture that already believes everything is God. So they came down to the Egyptians, supposedly walked among them openly and tried to share technology with them to say, hey, here's how you can extend your lifespan. And they did that by building the pyramids of Giza. And so the pyramids, according to the law of one, were healing centers and slash initiation centers. So if you know about like sacred geometry, biogeometry, you know that uh, triangles or, you know, tetrahedrons, pyramids have very powerful ability to concentrate energy because energy follows lines. And so lines pointing to one uh, single point will create a tremendous amount of energy through that point. So they were using these pyramids. They built them to be centers of healing for the physical body and initiation for the spirit. So like if you've gone to Egypt and you've visited those pyramids, you've noticed that they're very like sensory deprivation tanky. Yeah, I can and give my direct experience if if that's okay with you. Um, well, I was just oh, please, yeah. I was just in Egypt in December, um, and we went with a group of people led by Robert Grant, and you were on one, that trip. Yes, yes. With, uh, Andre. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Awesome, was, man. He was and, telling me a little bit about it. And this this uh, crystal, uh, the Andara, came. It was accompanying me through that whole trip, even inside the pyramid. So. We're charging some of that pyramid energy and healing energy into this conversation right now. But just in, as you said, the sensory deprivation, when I walked into the king's chamber, you could immediately feel like this vortex of energy. And we all sort of dropped into this state and everyone wow. started doing their thing. Some people were channeling. Obviously, Matias uh, De Stefano was doing his thing over here. And then we got the opportunity to all go into uh, the tomb. Uh, the sarcophagus and and Robert sort of told us a sound that would resonate at the tone um, and when you would do that sound inside of the of the sarcophagus it's almost like and the only you know analogy I can think of is like a car engine when you turn it on like vroom, like when you would when you would say this sound when you would tone the whole chamber would start going like woo woo mm -hmm. woo 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 and then yeah dude in the law of one Ra calls it the resonating chamber wow huh. so there you go let's, that's okay let's get into heal. that let's get into that <laughs> they, they would actually use sound energy uh emission of sound to create a resonating chamber effect that wow. would cause healing in the, at the cellular level because we know everything's frequency so if you play a harmonious frequency loud enough, strong enough in a resonating chamber, it actually starts blasting through your cells, just like EMFs do that disturb the cellular balance and the organized pattern of sound harmony establishes harmony in the cells. Huh. So your body gets healed of diseases. So that was Ra's purpose in building the pyramids was to reverse the aging process for humanity to elongate the aging process by giving them the ability to heal themselves and then uh, to teach them how to initiate into uh, what they would call intelligent infinity a mm. cosmic consciousness. They were teaching them how to access through the pineal and the crown chakra intelligent infinity, which is kind of their word for God. God uh -huh. is intelligent infinity. Best description ever. 
Uh, and so that was like a spiritual initiation point. I think the queen's chamber and the king's chamber, I have to go back and read, but one of them was more meant for physical healing and one of them was more meant for initiation. I would imagine the king's chamber having that resonating effect was probably the healing center, but yeah. who knows? It, they could have functioned with both capacities. Yeah. The king's is the heart, the heart chakra of the pyramid. And they are mm -hmm. uh, supposedly, according to Leonardo da Vinci and the Vitruvian man painting, there are three hidden chambers that we have not found yet, um, but are we, we're beginning to uh, make some discoveries on that in the, wow. the, the throat. Not surprised. And then there's two above that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful, man. Yeah. So with the with the law of one and all that material that's come up, why did Ra feel the need to come back as a social memory complex and endow us again with these teachings? Like where did mm. things run astray in a sense? Yeah. They talk about how at some point they were trying to teach the law of one to the Egyptians that all is one, all beings are equal and help them to understand the nature of the universe, that there's a positive polarity and a negative polarity, et cetera, seven densities. But they basically said that this knowledge started to be used by the elites to create social structures and hierarchies, right? Of hidden knowledge that you plebs aren't allowed to know and secret knowledge for the elites only. Yeah. And so they perceived that they had um, begun to infringe and overextend their boundaries. And so they said, okay, let's just leave. And let's come back in the future when we can clear this mess up. And so they came, they said they'd been looking for a harmonious group of entities that they could contact on earth and deliver this information to in a way that wouldn't instantly create a call to a religion out of it, but would just be like, here's knowledge for all humankind, you know? And they said that the, the raw contact, Don, Carla, and Jim from the 1980s, was the first group they had found that really met their standards of purity of contact. And so they came back in the 80s through this group of, what's cool is they were actually extraterrestrial researchers, yeah. um, L&L research. And uh, Don Elkins was a um, electrical engineer. Uh, Jim McCarty, I think he might have been a chemist or something like that, but they had pretty good... Um, scientific understanding yeah. mm -hmm. of these things and they were trying to figure out what's this ufo phenomenon all about you know why are these beings here and why are they doing this why are they just flying around in our skies and letting us observe them but they're not coming down to talk with us and so they um you know there was a lot of ufo activity in the 70s and 80s um and so they they had this brilliant idea of hey if we want to understand who these beings are and why they're here we should probably get a lot more interested in their spirituality and philosophy rather than their technology. Mm -hmm. And so they said, what if we could communicate with them through channeling? Maybe these beings are operating on a higher frequency of consciousness where they can just telepathically pick up thoughts. And so through channeling, maybe we could channel to them and talk to them. So they began doing these channeling sessions with uh, 12 total people. And funny enough, uh, one of the girlfriends of the group was like, hey, can I join your channeling group today? And he was like, sure, you can sit in and watch. So she <laughs> sure, babe, sure, babe, you can give me your number sure, afterwards. Babe, <laughs> yeah. And dude, isn't it funny how women just like notoriously are better channelers than men by nature? I've heard that. I've heard that. It just always seems to be the case um, for obvious reasons. But she joins in and she's like, wow, this is cool. I want to learn how to do this. And so she starts learning and starts um, making some pretty incredible contact very quickly. And so she joins the group and uh, one day she's teaching a new student how to channel. And she's like, let me give you a demonstration. I'll go into a channeling state. She goes into a channeling state and what comes through is I am Ra and mm. Ra starts speaking. And Jim McCarty, who ended up becoming her husband later, uh, is walking in the door with a bunch of grocery bags. And here's this, and uh, Dawn is listening from like the kitchen or something, just like, oh my God, we got a real contact going on here. And Jim comes in, is like, I got the groceries. And he's like, shh. <laughs> you know? And he's like, what? He's like, we got something real. It's getting good. It's like, getting good. Really? So, so they, they do this channeling session with her and they're like, this is legitimate. This is a real entity of some sort. We got to dedicate a private setting for this. 
So they created the raw contact, which was just the three of them, Carla, the channeler, Don, the questioner, Jim, the scribe. And they did 106 sessions over four years with Ra. And Ra answers all these questions that I'm giving you the kind of the information about over those 106 sessions. And yeah, explains the history of Egypt and why they came to Egypt and why they're now trying to reteach the law of one to humanity in a way that is balanced and not distorted towards power and stuff. And so, you know, I feel a sacred honor in teaching the law of one publicly and trying to further that mission of Ra. Yeah, and, and, and I was in the last couple of days going through some of the texts and going through the wording that they use. And it's it's very complex uh, word. You have to really be in a, in a certain state to be able to receive that. I'm really curious to know, as you know, you've gone into all different subjects around the law of one. Is there a concept right now that you are are integrating in your life or you're maybe struggling to wrap your mind around? What is that right now that maybe we can unwrap um, that you're that you're looking into? I love the question, man. Um, I'm I'm always going deeper into the law of one. I, I never feel like I've arrived in any way. I'm always just marveling at this text and just plumbing the depths of it. Yeah. And every time I read it through or listen to it through, I'm on my 10th or 11th time through it. it. It truly feels like I've never read it before. It's like a new text every time. And I'll be driving in my car with my jaw hanging open while I'm on my 10th time through <laughs> this book. Because you're like, different. You're different. Yeah. So the energy you receive will hit different. Every time I read it, it changes things in me and my awareness and my consciousness. And so when I go back and read it again, three months later, I'm a new being in that sense. And I pick up new things. So to get to your uh, question, what I've been really passionate about teaching recently in, um, I have an online community called 4D University. 4D stands for fourth density, of course. And what I've been teaching in my lectures recently has really been a lot about the concept of spiritual balancing from the law of one, which has just been, it's taken me, you know, almost 10 years now of reading the law of one to really understand or feel like I really understand finally what Ra's pointing out here. Cause it's really just one session. They go over it and they reference it a few other sessions, but there's only one session where Ra kind of gets into the technique and just kind of gives one example of it. So in trying to practice it and contemplating it for years, I've come to the understanding of what I really think Ra was pointing at, which is that the spiritual path in and of itself or, or existence in a physical body itself is like a paradox because we have two kind of two parts to ourselves. We have the human and the divine. Mm. And the big mistake that most spiritual seekers make is that they want to get rid of their suffering. So when they come to spirituality, they're like, great, finally something that can free me from my pain. And they try to get rid of the humanness and reach only for their divinity. When actually <clears throat> true enlightenment is about the merging of both and seeing the human as divine and not rejecting it, but inviting it into your divinity. So spiritual balancing is the practice of, I see it like a teeter totter where we have these two perspectives that are always available to us in every moment. We have the absolute perspective and the relative perspective or the divine and the human, uh, non-duality and duality. Yeah, we could give a lot of other um, examples, but I have to balance both perspectives mm -hmm. in every circumstance I go through. And isn't that what spiritual bypassing is? is when we try to only cling to the divine absolute perspective and we're not really acknowledging the human perspective. We call that bypassing. And so the teeter-totter is getting tipped towards the divine perspective and we're leaving out the human perspective or trying to dismiss it actually and make it invalid. And so spiritual balancing is having cultivating the awareness of which perspective am I over-imbalanced in here. Because if I'm suffering, it's because I'm imbalanced in my perspectives. So for example, if you study, uh, you know, a lot of people study non-duality obsessively and they get to this place where they kind of become like they've had a frontal, a spiritual frontal lobotomy or something, 
where they're, everything is unreal. It's all an illusion. None of it exists. It's all There's an no illusion, person. bro. Yeah. <laughs> she didn't break up with you. It's all an illusion. <laughs> yeah. I mean, dude, I, I tell this story a lot on podcasts, but I watched a non-duality video once years ago with uh, some non-duality teacher kind of sitting up front on a stool with an audience and they're doing a Q&A. And you see the people who've been studying these teachings so vehemently, like trying to phrase their questions without tripping over any of the non-duality wires, you know? And so this lady is trying to ask a question and she's like, so uh, the mic is shaking in her hand, you know? She's like, so um, my 12 year old son recently passed away from cancer, but it didn't really happen. <laughs> what? So, I mean, uh, wouldn't you call that a huge imbalance? Bypassing, yeah, the reality totally, of the man. truth. And it's like, that's true though, of course. It is true that your son didn't really die because your son is an eternal living consciousness that is one with the creator. And what is real cannot die. But it's also true that you, the human, experienced the loss of your mortal son who you loved. And it's painful to be without his presence in your physical life. So that part of you needs to be seen and welcomed into the light of love as well and not dismissed as, well, that's a wrong perspective. So I don't believe that anymore. Nothing really happened. It's an imbalance, right? So you would need to, I would give that woman advice to let yourself be broken, sweetheart. You know, Grieve. go into that pain. Yeah. That's where the healing happens because the key to spiritual balancing, which is amazing to me is, I guess I just call it like the slingshot effect. I haven't come up with a better name for it yet, but... If you go deep enough, let's say you go into the humanness, right? If you go deep enough into your humanity and you allow yourself to fully live out your worst fears, your worst nightmares, your greatest anger, your worst pain and sadness, you go all the way into that perspective, it will actually slingshot you over to the divine perspective. It's just an amazing thing that consciousness does, kind of like a, a quantum particle, like reversing polarity, which they can do. You can actually, by going deep enough into one side of the spectrum, you can reverse to the other side. And all of a sudden, this greater perspective comes in of, oh, everything's eternal. It's all good. God is love. All is well. And you intuitively understand that in your own being rather than needing a teacher to explain it to you. And you try to accept it and believe it, even though you're suppressing all this pain. It doesn't work if you're suppressing a perspective. You have to fully welcome that perspective. And then it becomes balanced. And Ra says, holding your apparent distortions along with your absolute perfection in equal balance, realization of the one takes place. Mm -hmm. And that's what spiritual balancing is. And Aaron, I know we both share these spiritual catalysts of relationships. And, you know, just as you were saying that I brought to mind, I personally um, just very recently went through a a breakup in a relationship um we were about together for a year and not to get too much into it but the week we had a week together um we did a trip together and it was like our honeymoon slash like we're gonna end it here because we both had different life paths she was moving away it was a, a, a sort of logistical issue um yeah <laughs> and we were together on this trip and I had never grieved so much in my life for, mm. you know, five, six days straight. I would look at her, just break down crying. Also, like just not angry at the universe and at the situation, but just kind of like asking, like, you know, this hurts, you know, just, you know, this hurts. And, yeah. you know, when it all, you know, went on the other side, as you talked about that slingshot, I just got these downloads and realization of, you know, this was all in the divine tapestry of your own life path and her life path. And you two were destined to meet each other at this uh, point. But you also have, you know, next points in your life and in your path. Um, yeah. Um, you know, in a, in a different way. So it's that love must come before wisdom, which is what you've mentioned says in the law of one. Um, mm -hmm. If we're all trying to, you know, get to the wisdom part of the intellectual, um, then we forget to feel things in the human in the human realm. So yeah, let's also get into the um, that importance of 
what happens if someone tries to go down the path of wisdom first and accumulate all this knowledge and information without going through the teachings of love and light? I mean, love um, first. Yeah, it's such a great question, man. And the the scariest answer, if we want to start with that, is that uh, that's the path of the negative polarity to have wisdom without love. That's the way that the negative polarity in consciousness uh, weaponizes truth to its own advantage to control people and take power over them. Is It's very true that knowledge is power. Um, of course, love is power as well. But wisdom without love is a kind of negative power for control. And so, you know, very few beings are truly destined for the negative polarity. In the Law of One, Ra makes one kind of delineation that um, around only around 10% of all beings in the universe are negatively polarized and about 90% are positively polarized. So, uh, it's, it's just kind of like whatever your destiny is, is the path you're going to take. But like, so I'm not saying you're going to accidentally become negatively polarized. If you try to gain too much wisdom without love, it's not what I'm saying. Mm. But what I am saying is that it might lead you to a lot of suffering because I mean, it did for me, honestly, because you you weaponize the spiritual ego with concepts that it can use against you. Yeah. The more that yeah. you know, the higher the standard ego can hold you to. And the moment you don't live up, guilt, shame, condemnation, yeah. right? Rains yeah. down upon you. So the only remedy for that is to first attempt to fill your being with the awareness of love's presence. Because in love, there can be no guilt, no shame, and no condemnation. And that's the, to me, man, it's the single hallmark error that most spiritual seekers make is that they reach for the wisdom before they reach for love. You know, they, they dive into books and teachings, which is great and has great benefit. But if you don't have a heart that vibrates with unconditional divine love, your ego will weaponize those concepts against you because only love is embodiment, Right. And the ego can use any concepts you have learned, but have not embodied yet. And so we want to really become embodied in love first before we gain too much wisdom. And honestly, man, this is why the ancient occult schools and mystery schools have kept secret knowledge like this. It isn't because they were trying to create some elitism or something. It's because giving the ego too much metaphysical knowledge before a certain degree of purification has happened creates a very powerful spiritual ego that can maybe take lifetimes to overcome. And so the, the path of initiation in almost every occult school I've studied and mystery school I've studied is they just teach the new seekers like righteous action, service to others, purity of heart, more humility, like the qualities and the virtues of love before they teach them the high level wisdom and concepts because then when they get to that part, they'll actually be ready for it. And they will be like a fertile soil where that wisdom can really grow. Mm. And, you know, one of the hallmarks of that heart centered path or in, in the shamanic cultures, they call it Camino Rojo is Jewish. Um, the first Jewish mystic, uh, Jesus and mm -hmm. You know, let's let's not even say he he had a lifetime uh, here on Earth. He wandered around on Earth, and if you had any idea of where where Jesus went in those lost years that we have heard about, and there is no record of where was he? Maybe was was he in Egypt, India? What was he doing um, to reach that that state of the I am of the love path? Where where was he? Where did he go? So have you um, studied Dolores Cannon's work at all? Yes. yes. Jesus and the, the Essenes? The, not that book. I've gone a little oh. bit into the convoluted universe. Yeah. Bro, you're in for such a treat <laughs> when, you, when you listen to that one. Hmm. Um, she does a regression with somebody who had a lifetime where they were like a, a kind of an older mentor of young Jesus as a little boy. And so um, it's just incredible. And so much of what's shared in that book has actually been corroborated since, I believe it was in the 80s when that was um, channeled, has been corroborated by new archaeological evidence that um, not only just how these cultures lived, like they, like they say in the book, but 
where they lived in distinction to one another and how the relationships were between the sects of Judaism. So uh, the Essenes were the mystical Jews of the first century who'd been around for a a very long time, but they were uh, hated by the Orthodox Jews Hmm. for obvious reasons. And so they couldn't afford to live in Jerusalem or Israel with all the other Orthodox Jews because they'd be, you know, stoned on the street if they were caught. So they had to escape far away into the Qumran Valley, which I'm not sure how far away that is from um, Jerusalem, but it's many hundreds of miles at least. And there was like, I think nine or 12 different, you might call them tribes or villages in the Qumran Valley. And there was one called Nazar in the Qumran Valley. And it's translated in the King James Bible as Nazareth, Nazareth. But in the actual uh, Aramaic word, it's just Nazar. And so it's interesting how they, they refer to Jesus in the New Testament as Jesus the Nazarene. And according to the way that you would translate those words in the King James, um, you would you would need to say the Nazarite, because that's the way you delineate in King James uh, someone of a certain village or region, um, Sodomite, Philist, uh, Philistine, um, uh, Canaanite, for example. These are the ways that those towns were referred to, but they call Jesus the Nazarene, E N E. And that's because Jesus was an Essene from Nazar. He was a Nazar Essene, which is abbreviated as Nazarene. Yeah. So he was a mystical Jew who was um, performing classic mystical Judaistic practices like physical healing by laying out of hands, praying and meditating in the wilderness in isolation. Uh, we could go on and on. And so Jesus in the in the uh, Jesus in the Essenes book, they say that he went to. Tibet and India and many regions in the East to learn from ascended masters who taught him about essentially his own I am divinity, his his power of oneness with God through the I am. And so Jesus returns back to Israel in the first century at about 30 years old, and he's speaking very differently than anyone else speaks. He's kind of speaking from this I am state where, you know, like human beings are in all kinds of states. Uh, There's the state of happiness. There's a state of unhappiness. There's even physical states like the state of birth, the state of uh, the dying process. You're always in a state, right? Of some sort. You're in a state of listening right now. I'm in a state of speaking. Jesus emerged from his journey in a state of the I am, if that makes sense. He was in a state where he knew himself to be the principal of consciousness and existence, right? Consciousness is I, existence is am. And so he knew himself not as a person, but as actually self-existing eternal principles of the universe. And not just intellectually, um, because a lot of people might say, okay, I I get that, Aaron. I'm I'm, I'm like Jesus now. Um, But he had to go through a whole initiation to reach that state. So what what was his initiation Mm -hmm. like? A a very long and gradual ego death process or ego dissolution process. Uh, This is classic, right, of all mystery schools and occult schools, uh, certainly classic of Hinduism and Buddhism, that you have to purify the mind from ego consciousness to perceive your divinity. Because as long as you're identified with a physical body, you'll never see the divinity that's shining beneath it or behind it. You're too focused on the form and the physicality. And so this is why Jesus said, hey, if you guys want to be my disciples, you got to die to yourself. Mm -hmm. He clearly wasn't advocating for physical suicide because nobody could be his disciple if they killed them, their physical body. So what self was he saying to die to? Of course, the egoic self. And if Jesus made the pre-qualification for his discipleship, ego death, then we can only assume that he had done that himself, right? Because it wouldn't be fair to expect others to do it if he himself hadn't done it. So he clearly was not speaking from an egoic personal position when he made these statements of, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And Christians will argue to the cows come home with me that, well, he even said himself, he's the way. So you got to confess him verbally as the way. It's like, no, you're missing it. He wasn't speaking from a personal position, clearly. He was speaking from a universal position or a state called the I am state. 
And he even says this in like the end of Matthew, the end of Mark. In my name, you will cast out demons, you will heal the sick, you will raise the dead. When he says in my name, that's whatever poor translation. It's his way of saying in my state, right? Uh The name of someone is like the identity, the essence of of what they are. Uh, Such that, you know, when Jesus said, I am the son of God, they tried to stone him for that because to claim being, to claim sonship of God is to claim equality with God, right? To claim you're the son of something is to claim equality with that thing. So names and essences had huge meaning in that culture in that day and age. So in my name is like in my essence, in my state, you will do the same things I've done and even greater things, he said. And he wasn't just a normal third density being, right? He was coming from somewhere else. Certainly. Yeah. And uh, in the law of one, Ra says Jesus was a late fourth density wanderer. A wanderer is somebody who is at a higher density and returns back to third density to be of service and to help a struggling planet, let's say. So they said he was actually a fourth density being who was eligible to graduate to his first fifth density lifetime on a fifth density planet somewhere. And in the law of one, fifth density beings are pure light bodies, Mm. um, pure electromagnetic energy. They don't have any kind of like chemical, physical vehicle suit that they're stuck in. They're pure light. So they can appear as a kind of an angel of light. They can take a form or they can just be an orb of light, but pure energy. So It's a very, very high level of consciousness. Jesus was about to graduate to that level, but instead, for whatever reason, chose to come back to third density and help this very deeply struggling civilization of the ancient Jews who were just locked in this monolithic view of God, this punitive, wrathful, vengeful, animal sacrificing view of who God is. I mean, they just couldn't have been more wrong about the divine. And Jesus was like, I want to go help that culture. And I want to go help that culture in a really big way. Mm. And they say that Jesus actually chose to be a martyr pre-incarnatively. He kind of understood that if I go into this culture and preach the truth, I'll be killed for it, but I'll also be remembered for it. And I can create a shift in consciousness in that culture. And um, I think the shift he created, man, personally speaking, was even much greater than his soul anticipated it would be. Really? Why is that? Why is that? I don't think his soul could have possibly seen it coming that he would have created the greatest religion on earth. Like, (laughs) you know what I mean? His lineage would have created that. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, obviously it wildly distorted his message, but just the impact in the, of the Christ symbol you know, Jesus on the cross with outstretched arms representing this ultimate state of forgiveness, uh, ultimate state of surrender, uh, kind of depicting total trust in the divine, total union with the divine, such that I can submit even unto death and forgive death itself. It's like that ultimate picture of what unity consciousness looks like. And he demonstrated it physically on the planet for maybe the first time ever to that extent. And it, that image has lived through time in a way that I don't think Jesus even predicted it would. And what do you think would need to happen in order for religion to not come with this distortion of the original teachings? Do you think that is possible? Is that a possibility that we could be headed to, or does it need to fall away completely? I don't think it's a possibility in the sense that religion as it is can live on with that new understanding because religion really is inherently and it's man's projection, the egoic projection of God from man. And so if, if Christianity changed its doctrines from this separation consciousness and punitive wrath type of, you know, Jesus died for my sins view. If they changed that to unity consciousness, it wouldn't be Christianity anymore. It would not resemble anything close to what Christianity has been. So really the religion to me is the belief system itself. And when it is transcended on our planet, we probably won't call it Christianity anymore. And we probably won't even have a name for a universal religion. Well, it'll just be love. It'll just be unity. You know, we'll transcend those labels altogether at some point. 
as you were saying that I saw a purple flash go across your camera or your screen. Um, I don't know what that was, but we'll just interesting. We'll just leave that in there. I'll have um, to watch it back. <laughs> um, you mentioned that Jesus at some point he went to study with ascended masters, right? So mm -hmm. I haven't heard you get too much into ascended masters. What is that process for a being in in whatever third density? to reach a state where they can become ascended masters and still assist humanity. Like we've heard St. Germain and, and other, yeah. and other figures. Well, I think an ascended master would just be, it would qualify anyone who has graduated from third density. So even a fourth density being could come back and become what we would consider an ascended master. Although even that's not guaranteed that, you know, like if a fourth density being reincarnates back into third, it's possible that they could live their life and not fully remember who they are and why they're here. They could kind of get trapped in the egoic mire of human life. Um, it's, it's rare that that happens, but it does happen uh, sometimes. But what usually happens is that souls who are carrying that higher frequency, when they incarnate back here into this planet, which has a lot of lower frequencies in it, uh, greed, pride, corruption, control, etc., death, violence, war. There's a contrast felt in our being of like, I don't feel good here. I don't belong here. This isn't right. This isn't the way it's supposed to be. And that will drive someone to a spiritual awakening. Mm -hmm. And then they may become in their later years, you know, a guru, an ascended master who can teach and people come to learn from. So it's anyone who's graduated from third density has that capacity. But I, my suspicion is that the, the true ascended masters, the Ramana Maharshis, the Nisargadattas, the Buddhas, the Christs are probably like fifth and sixth density beings um, or, or higher who are coming back to really be of service in a big way. Um, so, yeah, it's just an interesting thing to think about of uh, why higher density beings come to our planet to undergo all the same pain and struggles we go through just to help us out. Um, it's a, very much an act of love on behalf of a soul who's like, hey, I could be hanging out up here in these heavenly dimensions, mm. but I'm going to go back to hell for a while to help those in hell, you know? Mm. Let's talk real quick about um, going back to, you had a, an amazing interview with Jim McCarthy, the scribe for the law of one. And you mentioned he had a little relationship there with, with Carla, and he mentioned that when they would uh, go into sexual intercourse before channeling, Carla could channel for much longer. And you guys got into that a little bit about how that energy can either positively or negatively polarize um, a person in, in, their, in their journey. So what is that importance of of the sexual energy in terms of spiritual polarization? Mm -hmm. Well, our sexual energy is our kind of our human energy, if we want to call it that. Uh, it's the energy that makes us a human. It's the energy that creates humans. And it's the same energy that can create our reality for us and manifest things that we desire. So it's a very powerful energy to harness. And the difficulty is most people squander it, especially men. And so they don't have a very big reservoir of it to use for spiritual ascension and manifestation. So sexual energy transfer is a cool subject from the law of one where Ra kind of explains the science of how sexual energy exchange works and based on the chakras. So the simplest way to understand it is that if you engage in the sex act with the intention of I'm going to conquer this woman, I'm possessing her, she's my pleasure, that is what's called a negatively polarized sexual energy transfer. But if you go into the sex act with the opposite disposition of, I love this being, I'm here to serve this being, I'm here to please this being, and to make love to this wonderful being, then you engage in what's called positively polarized sexual energy transfer because the heart chakra, the green ray, is now involved in the act. And so I call it, um, my wife and I call it green ray sex just for, uh, <laughs> simplicity, but like in that dressing, dr dressing green the night before. <laughs> yeah. Put on the green panties, babe. 
<laughs> when you when you exchange green ray with someone, you feel it tangibly because sex feels incredibly fulfilling. It feels recharging. You know, you and your partner are laying there together in bliss and euphoria, staring up at the ceiling, just like, wow, what an experience. Mm. And what's also cool about it is that sex is unique and different every single time when it's from the heart. It's like a new experience. Something new happens. A new depth is reached. It's always new in some way, at least I've noticed. Mm. Whereas negatively polarized sex from the lower three chakras dominance and possession, it's the same exact thing every time. It does not matter how many partners you change it out with, it's the yeah. same exact sex over and over. And yeah. that's why people get bored of having sex with the same person when it's only a negatively polarized exchange happening because they want something new, but they can't create something new because it's all about dominance and possession. So they just have to find a new person to dominate and possess. And it's that endless void that can't be fulfilled or satisfied. Mm. And something I didn't grow up too much with an imprint of religion. I know you did being the son of a pastor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in your first marriage, you you decided to wait um, until you got married um, to do that. And I was wondering where what where things can go astray when. For example, we grow up with this like dogma or, or mm -hmm. even like sexual repression around this sacred energy. Um, what, what can even happen and, and what, what did you go through in your experience? Yeah, it's not good, man. It's not, <laughs> not good. good. Not recommended. <laughs> yeah, highly don't recommend. Uh, you know, I went through that big time. So what I learned is that, first of all, to suppress sexual energy is a terrible idea because it can't be suppressed. It's, it's going to find a way to express. And then that just creates unbelievable, unfathomable amounts of guilt um, to the point where like when I was growing up, if I had sex with my girlfriend when I was a Christian kid, I literally felt like I murdered somebody. Wow. I felt like yeah. I just did the most evil act in the universe. Like just God like is just guilt. looking down yeah. with, yeah, with just lightning judgment bolts coming from his eyes, you know, towards me. And, uh, that's a terrible energy for a, a kid to live in first of all. But, um, it also creates this separation between you and your partner because there is a polarity that wants to explore itself and express itself in a relationship through sexual energy in a sacred and loving way. And when you deny that innate natural divine desire to connect with someone you love like that, it creates huge rifts in that relationship as well. And so what it did for my ex-wife and I was that even on our wedding night, when we tried to consummate our marriage, it felt we still felt the same exact amount of guilt. Mm. Nothing changed. We didn't feel any better about it than before. Yeah, it was programmed into you in a way. It was a program and programs don't know context. They just know stimulus. Sex, bad. Sex, wrong. Mm. You know? So we had to work through that. And I mean, obviously didn't really work through it because we got divorced, but yeah, I mean, just talk about incredible suppression, self-suppression, um, denial of self and really like making something so holy and sacred about you, like evil. It's, it's very distorted. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. When you were 27, 28, you said you had a two week free sample of enlightenment. And I also heard you describe enlightenment as this whole neurobiological transformation that we have to go to. And, you know, you got to experience and get a taste of it. And I was wondering um, for people that say, like, oh, my goal in this life is to be enlightened. You know, maybe a lot of people on the spiritual path and even getting a taste of it is, I also heard you say that, you know, you'll try anything to reach enlightenment. Um, mm -hmm. I know you said that jokingly, but in hindsight, is there a place where you would draw the line um, where it just becomes like too much? Uh, or, or is it just like full on, this is the path? Well, I mean, I definitely wouldn't do anything that hurts somebody else. Because mm. how unenlightened can you get, you know? <laughs> but in the context of, if it's just me who has to suffer to get to enlightenment, I'm in. Like, I'll do whatever. You know, I'll, I'll walk through any fire. Mm -hmm. I'll go through any storm. 
And I think we need that tenacity to reach it because the ego is so committed to its thought system and dominating our mind with its thought system that if we don't meet it with at least equal force, we have no chance of truly transcending it because it's working night and day 24 seven to kidnap your attention at all times. And so if you don't meet it with the same level of intentionality and discipline and devotion to being free, it's going to keep kidnapping your attention and making you identify with it and all of that. So the suffering is the evolutionary driving force that gets us all to that point where we're like, nothing matters more to me than my inner peace of mind. And so I will do whatever it takes to earn it. And then we go through the, the mind purification process that's necessary for enlightenment. And that was what I didn't have at 27 when I had that, you know, free sample experience of enlightenment. I, I had not done the preliminary work to purify my mind, my nervous system. Mm. And so eventually those programs came back online and spiraled back up into the mind and started working again. And I was uh, cast from heaven, as it were, or at least as it felt. And that brought a whole bunch more guilt with it because it was like, hey, you were permitted entry into the kingdom of heaven. And then you were analyzed and found unworthy and kicked out of heaven. Did you feel did you feel unworthy at that point? Oh, yeah, man. Huh. Like, I, you can't even imagine that level of unworthiness of, I literally spent two full weeks in an unbroken state of, of God intoxication and bliss. And then all of a sudden, within a day, my ego had come back online completely and dragged me back down into that pit of hell where it was just me in a small prison cell with the ego chirping away in my mind being like you were kicked out of heaven you weren't worthy of it you didn't deserve it god found you lacking and booted you out and i'm just like how do i argue with that uh -huh. and that's what happened but it was because i hadn't done the inner purification to sustain that state on a permanent basis and that's why i'm so passionate about teaching about kundalini awakening now because kundalini is sexual energy first of all that we move higher up the spine as we preserve it and let it build up and accumulate. And we use it for spiritual purposes, you know, meditation, breath work, prayer, devotion. We, we do these things that calls the sexual energy up the spine through the energy centers. And the closer it gets to reaching that third eye, um, the closer we are to becoming a fourth density being, at least as far as our nervous system is um, considered, because it's upgrading our nervous system. Literally the cells in our body are increasing their capacity to hold energy. So that's why when we have these mystical moments, oneness experiences where we're like, oh, I see it, it's all one, oh, bliss, divine. And then a minute later, whoop, right back, back down there. into, now it's all separate and boring. It's like, why does that happen? Because you, you maxed out the RPMs on your nervous system's engine. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You didn't have the bandwidth to sustain that high frequency. So your nervous system can do it for like a minute. And then it's like, I'm worn out. Back down to ego consciousness. So that you literally have to raise your vibration to sustain those frequencies. And that's what a kundalini awakening process is. It is, as you said, a neurobiological transformation at the cellular level. Uh, from a third density vibration to a fourth density vibration, where classically, if you study Kundalini awakenings, um, you know that once Kundalini reaches the crown, somebody is living from that state of bliss permanently and effortlessly without any effort on their part. You're just seeing oneness as naturally as you ever saw anything before. And so I, I'm very passionate about teaching people how this process works and how to initiate that process within yourself. Yeah. And can someone still operate, quote unquote, normally in the matrix? Let's say like if I have a full on Kundalini awakening and then tomorrow I have to go to work, can I still do that? Am I just going to be in a different state of consciousness or I have to send in my resignation letter? <laughs> I'm in no, bliss, bro. In that, I'm that good. Resignation, bro. You're cooked. No chance. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's a great question because um, in some ways, yes, in some ways, no. Uh, a person who's ascended their consciousness to the fourth density level will have no interest in partaking in 
normal societal things like clubbing, drinking, sex, drugs, rock and roll, all of that, the, the vain pursuit of pleasure will have no interest to you at all. So you may quit your job if you're working at a nightclub or something, or you know doing something that's just in direct contrast to your new state. Um, but outside of that, you become uh, much more dynamic and intelligent and powerful and efficient in your daily life from that state of consciousness because it's a higher state of consciousness. Like in the same way that self-consciousness is very superior to simple animal consciousness, like animals can't build buildings and create computers. And, you know, there's a huge gap between what a human can do and what an animal can do. There is the same gap between what a third density conscious being can do to what a fourth density being can do. Because when you activate the heart chakra, uh, the heart chakra is the energy center that also contains our inner genius and our creativity, that feminine intelligence to create and inspire and have new ideas is the heart chakra. I mean, Albert Einstein talked all about this, that uh, his intelligence was not purely cerebral, but it was like deeply inspired from his heart, from his yeah. passion. And so you access... Uh, it's called creative genius, but like whatever you're good at, for example, music, art, writing, whatever, you become like a genius at that thing. Like you move into a new category of skill because again, the heart is more intelligent. It perceives deeper layers of reality. It connects the dots of all the relationships of everything that are happening. And that's how you truly understand something, right? Is understanding all the relationships it's engaged in that make it what it is. The heart sees those relationships. And so you just have this ability to like innately understand things. You take up a hobby and you become really good at it like right away. Whereas other new students are struggling, struggling, struggling to get the basics. You're understanding like first principles inside of your awareness. So everything becomes easier for you. Um, conversations become easier because you're more still inside and you're able to listen deeper to what someone's really saying. And all these different things make you much more dynamic in, whether it's in your career, in your relationships, in your personal life, in your hobbies, it, the heart chakra enhances everything you do to a, to a very large extent. Mm. And when talking about the new children that are coming onto the planet right now, um, in, the, in the raw material, they even talked about the dual activated body where they're coming in with some of that yellow and also the green ray. Mm -hmm. um, activating these psychic abilities, living more from the heart. Where do you see the world heading as these newer generations start stepping into that heart-centered consciousness? Everything you just mentioned about the heart, how would the paradigms of the world shift um, going forward into the future? W what do you predict? <laughs> yeah, it's um, be a bold prediction. You know, I don't really know for sure, but with the way I understand how consciousness evolves, I can make some theories. And uh, beginning with that idea of the dual activated body, what that is, is beings who are born with an activated heart chakra or active Kundalini. Um, they don't have to go through a Kundalini awakening process because they're born with it already active. And so we're not, um, we can't escape our third density body in this life because you're born as a third density being, physically speaking, but you can upgrade the nervous system to a fourth density level. And that, if enough of us keep doing that, the body quickly has to catch up and uh, match the level of frequency that our nervous system's operating on. And that's what, that's how the evolution of consciousness works from every level is that Consciousness perceives new things and the physical body has to adapt to adjust to those new things. And so in the fourth density, for example, the physical body is uh, usually, not always, but usually much taller and much thinner and much more vibrant and bright in its appearance. Like, you know, you can look at your skin, you have a good, nice glow to your skin. You can see my it's, skin. It's that lighting, bro. It's that lighting. Just good lighting, of course. No. <laughs> Uh, but there is a light behind our skin, right? That is somewhat palpable. But if you've seen like Avatar, the movie Avatar, mm -hmm. those beings are probably a lot closer to what humans are going to look like in the fourth density mm -hmm. over, you know, thousands of years of evolution is we'll become taller. We're already becoming taller. That's a fact. Um, less hair will eventually be hairless. Uh, 
all the primitive animalistic aspects of the body get transcended over time. And uh, we more and more become a light body as time goes on. So a, a fourth density being would have skin that has a bright glow to it, uh, maybe even radiant to behold, but still, a, still skin with a body, but more light in the body. Mm. So we're like, when you activate your Kundalini, you're turning on that light body inside of yourself and increasing the vibratory capacity of your cells. Yeah. So as humanity evolves like that, more people awaken their Kundalinis, um, we will see this huge contrast, I believe, start to happen where everybody who's walking around with an awakened Kundalini will have such a distinct advantage in career and finance, everything. You're a vastly superior being in all ways that those beings who are still struggling back in the third density who haven't awakened yet will see the contrast of people who have awakened Kundalini and they'll say, man, it's just, I got to awaken my Kundalini. It's, it, there's nothing else that's worth my time than this, you know? And so that's the way evolution pretty much always works, right? Is that new adaptations show their superiority. And so more and more of that species wants to gravitate towards the new adaptation until eventually the whole species has that new adaptation and the old has been discarded by evolution. So humanity is doing that right now, but that will continue to increase rapidly over time to where I think we'll get to a point where nobody will be able to deny that there is a higher level of consciousness available and there's a certain way to reach it. And these things we call spiritual, mystical, metaphysical will be like normal science one day that kids are taught in school, you know, Kundalini, astrology, all of this stuff will be basic science at some point. But uh, we're, you know, the fact that these things are still considered like esoteric pseudoscience is just kind of a testament to where our collective level of consciousness is. Do you have any insight regarding um, when we talk about the missing link of when, you know, the, the race was going from Neanderthal, all of a sudden they started appearing in, in different forms eventually to what the Homo sapiens sapien. I just got that thought as you were explaining this process of mm -hmm. this breakout point. Um, yeah, is that related in some way? Um, yes and no. Where I'm, I'm fairly convinced that this is the case based on many channeled works I've read and what our scientific literature shows us is that there is this really remarkable doubling in brain size over about 200,000 years, I think, um, which is a feat totally unparalleled in all of nature. Never has been done anywhere close to that. It's a, a huge mystery to biologists. How did the human brain double in size that fast? Um, normally over a 200,000 year period, you might see a 10% increase in brain volume and capacity, but doubling, like something anomalous clearly happened. <laughs> and tons of texts say this, the law of one says this, that it was actually extraterrestrials who were watching the evolution of the ancient primates and saying, hey, this is a really slow evolution. Let's help them out a bit and add a few changes to their genomic sequence or whatever that will propel the evolution of consciousness forward. And what's interesting is that uh, Ra says what they did was they enhanced the emotional capacity of the primate. And that has some really amazing implications because by causing primates to be much more emotional, it forces consciousness to awaken in new ways to cope with those emotions. Mm -hmm. It puts an, an intense demand on the brain to intellectually cope with those feelings and understand them and give meaning to them. And so it, it catalyzed those ancient primates to becoming self-aware very quickly. Because when you're aware of what you feel inside, you're looking inside a lot. Who am mm -hmm. I? What am I feeling? I feel, I feel. And all of a sudden, who am I is born. So the interesting thing is I watched a guy, a, um, I was an archaeologist or a paleontologist. I believe it was on Rogan. I could be wrong. But he was talking about this amazing discovery in the, um, some region in Africa where they discovered a, where a lot of ancient primates, Neanderthals, um, Homo erectus, whatever, where they were living. And there's lots of remains, skeletal remains. 
And they say, when you go through the layers in the uh, geology of the soil, you have like primitive hunter gatherers, ancient Neanderthal looking beings. And then the next layer above you have pottery art use of tools. Yeah. Let's go back, go Beckley Tepe. Yes. Um, thank you. Region. Go Beckley Tepe in Turkey. Mm -hmm. And so you're like, how do you explain that? How do you get this monumental leap in intelligence that quickly? And to me, I can only say it must have been a outside force, you know, contributing to that evolution in some way. Because I don't know outside of um, outside of Terence McKenna's theory about <laughs> the stone <mushrooms>, ape, <laughs> the stone ape theory. Outside of that one, I don't know any other plausible theory that could account for that. Mm, I see. Yeah, yeah, and. Right now, you know, we are sort of, you know, even I'm, I'm a student of the gene keys as well. So how our DNA is, is shifting. Keys. Yeah, how it's shifting right now. Mm -hmm. um, I can imagine, you know, we mentioned the nervous system a lot um, in, in this segment. I'm curious to know, what are you practicing in to prepare the nervous system for what's coming? So what I teach in Forty University in our, we have a curriculum of, of three programs that takes seven months to complete. And the third program is three months long and it's called 4DAP, which stands for Fourth Density Ascension Protocol. And it's basically like a um, combination of all the different teachings that I myself have used over my 10 year journey of uh, Kundalini Awakening. And uh, things like Kriya Yoga, different basic kundalini yoga practices like bandhas and and mudras and breath work pranayama uh, but it's all very like nervous system stimulating and then we combine that with um we do a breath work practice with a 20 minute deep meditation and then there's other teachings as well about like understanding what kundalini is how to notice when it's awakening more and more and there's many very telling signs that kundalini is active or becoming more active in the nervous system. There's even some supplements you can take that will help a little bit, but it's basically getting in touch with your Kundalini energy, what it feels like. And once this process sets off, man, it's really amazing because you're just an observer of the process where you're watching Shakti or Kundalini making her way through your nervous system, however she pleases. And uh, the only thing you can really do is you can you know, ask her to slow down a bit or you can do things to tell her to put her foot on the gas a bit. And so we call that self-pacing in 40U of like, if you're getting way too many Kundalini symptoms and it's kind of ruining your life at this point, <laughs> you can, you, there's things you can do to self-pace and, and calm that energy down a bit. But I kind, of, I kind of tell people like, hey, you're going through a very sacred divine transfiguration process. So you probably don't wanna interfere with it too much if you're doing a lot of breath work and kundalini practices that are stimulating it, you can definitely stop doing those and just let it take its natural course. But um, I don't really recommend anyone do like really intense grounding practices that will quell kundalini, like eating a high calorie diet, um, doing really intense exercise will calm her down. Mm -hmm. Unless you are just at that breaking point of like, I can't handle this anymore. It's too much is coming up, too much to synthesize. I need some space here. Then I'll say, all right, eat 3000 calories tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And that's going to help a lot or something like that. So it's a very individualistic journey of everyone's journey is different. Everyone's awakening is different. Some people never even have the inner conjunction happen. You know, the lightning bolt up the spine that is notoriously classified as a Kundalini awakening. That's just a, that's just a signpost that an awakening is really underway in a huge dynamic way, but you can have a full Kundalini ascension process without having the lightning bolt shooting up your spine. Mm -hmm. So there's, it's a, there's myriad ways you can approach it. And I, I just find it endlessly beautiful and uh, fulfilling to teach that process to others. When I was living in California, my mom uh, got into, you know, she had her own awakening and she eventually got into kundalini yoga, became a, a, a trainer, an instructor in that. So that's always been in sort of in my purview. And yeah. also when I became a student of Joe Dispenza's work and I started going to some of the retreats, doing that breath practice, at the beginning I wouldn't feel anything. 
And now over time, as I start doing that breath, I just like it, it's getting more intense uh, in, in a way. I can start feeling it way more in in the pineal and the brain and the higher centers mm -hmm. before I'm like, I don't even know if this is going up. Like <laughs> if the, the snake is asleep, um, yeah, it feel but like that. if someone reacts to this, you know, a lot of people might have the spontaneous awakening where they wake up in the middle of the night shaking or whatever. What if they, me. yeah, yeah. It happened to you just like that. Uh huh. And how did you react to it? Well, I, I just had to witness the experience because it was unbelievably intense, but um, also incredibly beautiful and divine. Um, what had happened was I'd been doing my yoga practices for a long time. And interestingly enough, I one night I just decided I was going to do three rounds of japa chanting with my mala necklace. So you have 108 beads and you you do a chant and you move the bead, right? And I used to like doing that, but I was like, I'm going to do three rounds of it. And so I did the um, Hare Shakti, Hare Shakti, Shakti Shakti, Hare Hare, mm. which is kind of like praise Shakti, praise Shakti. And I was really connecting as I did it. It took me 30 minutes to do it. I was really connecting with the goddess, you know, Shakti and like really like praising her. And I got in this chant altered state, you know. <laughs> I go downstairs and my, my wife had made, um, I believe it was, uh, we had pho that night, I think, mm -hmm. and then some cookies or something like that. And what's funny is I found out later through reading a book called Biology of Kundalini that eating a, a high glycemic meal can really supercharge Kundalini with all the sugar and carbs. Really? Huh. And so I think that combination of eating a lot of carbs that night <laughs> and doing the chanting created the inner conjunction that I had because I laid down on the couch next to her to watch a show or something. And I, have you ever had restless leg syndrome? No, no. What is oh, that? Oh, you haven't. Okay. Uh -uh. Well, the listeners who've had it will know what I mean. It's uh, this really irritating feeling of restlessness in your legs mm -hmm. to where you're like squirming around and moving your legs and you, you flex them, you stretch them. You're trying to get this tension out. It's kind of like being really sore, but a bit different. Mm. So I'm sitting on the couch with horrible restless leg syndrome, which I had had a few times in my life, but never this bad. And I can't sit still. And my, my wife is like, babe, are you all right? What's going on? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. I just have restless leg syndrome. It's crazy. So I go to bed an hour later or so, and I'm laying, I'm laying face down because laying on my back for some reason made the restless leg syndrome way worse. So I'm laying on my stomach and I'm kind of like, I'm like still moving around in bed uncomfortable. And I did that for like an hour probably. And just was trying to breathe through it. It was super intense. And I eventually started to drift off to sleep from exhaustion. And then I woke up to, um, the so feeling like someone connected a fire hose to my lower spine mm -hmm. and just started blasting water up my spine. It was like this, Oh, like waking up out of oh. nowhere. And it was just surging up my spine with a current of energy. I can't describe and I literally saw in my vision, and this was the craziest part to me, was that I saw the actual goddess Shakti, who is, um, she looks blue in the Indian depiction with six arms and all the adornments and jewelry. I literally saw her exactly like that, appearing before me with like blazing fire behind her eyes and like dancing before me like this. And I was just marveling at her because I've, I've probably only seen a picture of the goddess Shakti a couple of times in my life before that. It's not like I had a, a figurine of her on my meditation altar or something. Yeah. I hadn't spent a lot of time with that image, but it was like right there. And I don't believe that that's how she actually looks. I don't think she has a form, but I'm fascinated by the fact that she appeared to me in her traditional Indian form. Yeah. And we had, there was a communication that happened, but... I was essentially locked in this position, you know, like spine arched, laying on my stomach with the sound of like a jet engine airplane in my ears as well. And there was this amazing interface of communication that happened between her and I just kind of telepathically. And it probably lasted, you know, five minutes or something. And then uh, the feeling subsided and classically, as almost every inner conjunction happens, I became as cold as a corpse in my body. I started shivering and covering up in the blanket, you know, going through that process. Cause she 
in doing that ascension through the spine, she's like burning up the prana in your body. Yeah. So you, you're left feeling like a dead body or something like a shell. And it takes a while for the warmth to come back into your body, which is pretty, pretty wild. So that was my experience of the inner conjunction. And your wife was right next to you the whole time. Yep. W what was her, like, what does she do? Like maybe we might have that experience with a partner that goes through that in the middle of the night. Yeah. What is there a protocol? You just leave them, you know, <laughs> do your thing. You're good. <laughs> yeah. She slept soundly, man. She didn't wake up. Huh. Amazing. I don't think I was moving that much and I definitely wasn't making much noise. Um, I was really like paralyzed yeah. and I went into a very like altered state. I didn't feel like I was in my body. I could feel the sensation of the body convulsing and stuff, but it felt like a hundred miles away or something. And I was in this kind of astral doorway with Shakti there just dancing for me and speaking to me. Wow. So I told her the next morning what had happened, but um, yeah, she didn't wake up for that experience. Yeah. Well, that's beautiful, man. Thank you. Thank you so much from, from the heart for sharing that. Um, I hope it happens again. <laughs> Maybe tonight, get some pasta in. Um, <laughs> you can always try. <laughs> Cookies and pasta. <laughs> Who's going to complain, right? If that's one takeaway. Order out tonight. Have some carbs in you, uh, some sugar. <laughs> <laughs> Brother, we end every show with a a segment called the final trio which are essentially rapid fire questions you can answer in any way that you want um before that i'd love to send people to your site to connect with you further so if there's anything else that you want to to mention for people to to head over to you um where would that be sure man so um i'm the same everywhere it's just aaron abke so aaronabke.com youtube.com slash aaron abke at Aaron Abke on Instagram, TikTok, super easy to find. And if you want to know more about my university, you can go to 4duniversity.com, which is number four, letter D, university.com. Gotcha. And we'll link everything uh, in the show notes. Um, for the final trio, the first two questions are personalized to the guests. And then the final one we ask at the end of every show. The first one is, when do you feel the most oneness? Mm, when do I feel the most oneness? That's a tough question to answer. Um, I guess if I have to give a practical answer, probably in my morning meditations where my entire goal is I do my breath work, uh, about a 10 minute breath work, uh, Kriya practice, and then I do uh, 20 minutes of meditation. And my only goal in meditation, at least now, is to just get lost in God absorption. And just to connect with the the beauty, the love, the splendor that God is and just let it overwhelm me. And so I spend uh, most of my mornings in a kind of samadhi state in meditation where, I mean, how can you say that that's not the most palpable oneness you're going to feel throughout the day? But that definitely doesn't mean that I don't experience devastating bliss looking at a tree or a bird, you know, on regular occasions because I do. But there's something about tuning out the physicality and just going into the non-physical, that is uh, uniquely special, I think. Yeah, I I, per I personally share that right now. I just came back from Portugal. I was getting a certification to do a breathwork training and a cold exposure, not Wim Hof. Ah. Um, it's it's another method. Um, but we spent you know the whole week in freezing cold lagoons, doing breathwork, the whole thing. And wow, it's hardcore, man. Uh, my master, he's very shamanic, uh, shamanic. And he gifted me some rapé. Um, ah. And I've been doing some rapé in the morning while meditating. And that has accelerated sort of that feeling um, of oneness, of just being wow. in, in that interconnectedness. Uh, so that's some sacred medicine that, you know, it, it just recently came into my life that is also putting me into that state. Uh, that's beautiful. beautiful, man. I, I actually use hapé as well. I call it hapé. Uh -huh. Instead of rapé. Yeah. Um, but I use, I use that very often, probably three to five days a week. Mm. I'll use it in it's my meditations. Powerful. It's powerful. What is, what is yes. that for people that don't know? So it's actually, it's called Zen Mist, I believe, or Meditation Mist from, um, man, I'm blanking on the company mm. that makes it. Um, I can, we can put it in your show notes if you want, yeah, in case sure. your audience wants it. But it's a, it's a Zen spray that you spray up the nostrils that has the kind of like hape tobacco in it with some CBG and some other things that um, really gets you awake and alert and ready to drop in. 
And then it has uh, a little bit of oxytocin in it as well. And so then it balances out with this kind of feminine opening. Um, so it's like not, it's like a modern version of Hoppe, but I do have regular Hoppe as well that I'll use sometimes. Yeah, it's powerful. I love it. Um, it's the, second qu- the second question, brother, um, this was sort of uh, along the lines of the Course in Miracles. We didn't, we, get, we didn't get too much into that. I'd love to do this again if, if we get the chance. Um, Absolutely, man. But the question is, what is the latest miracle you've encountered or experienced? Mm. Shifts in perception are happening all the time, man. Uh, and that's, that's the definition of the miracle, for those who don't know. In A Course in Miracles, um, what was the one I was just talking about the other day? I've, ha- I've had a great shift around my relationship to work, which we touched on a little bit, I think, at the beginning. But um, I, I'm somebody who just doesn't like to go by my calendar for whatever reason. I don't like looking at my calendar because mm-hmm. I feel like I'm being told what to do rather than what I want to do. And I just want to be in like that feminine energy of like, I'm going to do what I feel like doing, you know, writing, reading, whatever. And so I had to, um, I needed a shift there because it became a point of stress to look at my calendar and look at the the meetings I have or the appointments I have. And I would notice my state of being contract when I would look at my calendar. And so I had a shift in perception of like, no one's telling me what to do. I chose these things. Like I chose to have this call. I'm the creator of my reality. These things are on my calendar because they're the things I want to do. You know, just that little reframe, that's what's actually called a miracle because it's a shift in perception from fear to love. Yeah. And so I moved from that kind of fearful, resisting relationship with my calendar to a excited, loving relationship with it. A miracle can be as simple as that, right? <laughs> And that's powerful because for people think that a miracle is something that has to happen to you. This is nothing happened in the outside world, but you just right. shifted your mentality, your perception around it. So that's, that's powerful. You Thank it. you for sharing that. Um, this last question we call the time capsule, the time capsule question. And it essentially encourages us to travel out a bit into the future around 15, 20 years um, I chose that time frame because that is the point where a lot of these next generation of leaders will be stepping into more leadership positions around the world. Um, and they're going to need a lot of guidance. They're going to need some wisdom. They're going to need some tools, resources. And you were given the opportunity to have a time capsule that then they would open um, when they are getting initiated to their leadership into the new earth and you could leave behind anything in this time capsule it doesn't have to be physical it could be a teaching a book a vibration a frequency whatever it comes to mind um but essentially they're going to open this time capsule and use that um that resource or that wisdom to carry out into the fourth density the new earth so Mm -hmm. what would you include in the time capsule and you said is in 20 years from now they would open it yes yes okay I mean, I can't think of anything better to put in there other than A Course in Miracles and The Law of One. <laughs> Might be an easy answer, but I, those two texts, I would put the I Am Discourses from St. Germain mm-hmm. as well. Those three texts have shaped my life far more than anything else has. And so much of what I teach and the things I share come from those texts, yeah. or at least my comprehension of those texts. So if, if I were to give people anything it would be like just read these texts and they're going to have the answers that you're looking for yeah and just today i ordered the hard copy of both uh course in miracles and law of one so i'm excited to get into that i know we'll we'll have to definitely do this again brother um and go even deeper i feel like we covered so much um thank you for your vulnerability your openness your wisdom your love Uh, it's been an honor and i hope to do this again soon The honor is mine, brother. Thank you for having me, and I'd love to come back anytime. Yes, sir. Let's go. (laughs) Wow. Powerful, man. Thank you. Good stuff, man. That was a really fun interview. 